a part of me when it looked at uh, a DNI summit, it became a little on the edge. And it said that, are they talking about discrimination and illusion? Because around us, a lot of us see a lot more discrimination and illusion happen rather than, you know, a DNI in the right spirit. Uh, I can start off with an example that I heard from one of the stars, or rather one of the most visible faces in the transgender community. Uh, there was an audition for an ad for toothpaste, and this person had one of the most perfect teeth without any cosmetic dentistry was shortlisted and then rejected, saying you can't make it because you're transgender. This person then went on to kind of be on the hoardings of one of the world's most watched spots, which was Times Square in New York. I'm talking about none other than Sushant Devgikar. But for many such Sushant Devgikars who make it to the limelight, there are many others who fall by the wayside. One such example has been the Six Pack Band, and uh, we have uh, the creator of the Six Pack Band uh, sitting with us, okay, which was a huge rage some years back. Unfortunately, uh, we don't hear too much about them today. Uh, on the other side, we see a lot of heartwarming commercials, and I'm sorry I'm bringing too many transgenders into this because they seem to be the most visible face of uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, so there is this very nice heartwarming commercial where the transgender goes and serves tea on a rainy day. And the end of the commercial, that's it. How much more can a brand take it beyond the commercial? That is something that, you know, was uh, haunting me ever since I kind of saw that commercial saying that, hey, this is lip service literally when it comes to being chai, and there can be many a slip between the cup and the lip. Uh, what about kind of mainstreaming transgenders? Maybe you can start like a chain of chai cafes was one of the ideas, but then if people are kind of having mind blocks saying who would kind of drink tea made by transgenders, maybe you could have just taken them into your ecosystem and kind of saved them from begging on the streets and so on because nobody offers them jobs. So you could have maybe taken them into your plantations. It would be such a lovely uh, thing to do. The other thing was we heard uh, Shri Gauri uh, give such a lovely speech. Could the Vic's touch of care, having, could, have, could they have taken it beyond the commercial and set up uh, care centers for transgenders who kind of are aged, because in a lot of cases, we find that these people, there's nobody to take care of them after a certain age, and they die on the streets, unclaimed, unsung. That's the reality, and which is why some of this seems to be like an illusion, that do advertisements actually say it just to make a quick buck? Or is there any real kind of conscience behind it? To kind of discuss this in detail, and I hope we uh, will make a lot of pertinent points which will not be discussions just for today and we forget it by the time we reach home. I am sure the star studded panel is going to give you a lot of key takeaways and they are practitioners who have done it across the spectrum of diversity. So to open up today's discussion, I would like to kind of start with Sumit. Sumit, uh, before I got introduced to him that he was on this panel, I have seen him several times on LinkedIn making a lot of impact. So Sumit, my first question to you here is that, you know, what is uh, your sense of diversity and inclusion in the advertising sense? Sure. Um, to answer that question, I would like all of you to do a small exercise. All of you who can get up, please get up. Please rise up. Please rise up. Try and clap your hand with one finger. One finger. Not happening. Two fingers. Three fingers. Four fingers. Now five fingers. 
with a small example, I demonstrated that when you talk about diversity and inclusion, you must have all the right elements in place. If you don't, you will fail to make an impact. When you talk about DEI, it stems from authenticity. And that brings the impact. Please take your seats. Thank you. And I think that was a much needed exercise post lunchtime. You know, Ashish was telling me that on a lazy Saturday morning in uh, Kolkata, which was kind of completely taken in by the puja fever, uh, Sumit apparently held an entire audience of some 300 people with full attention. So that's the power of Sumit. With 45 speakers from across the country. 45 speakers, but he still managed. I think we need to hear a louder round of applause, not that one finger applause. Thank you so much. So, so yeah, Sumit, just to kind of yeah. take that question forward, how do you see advertising evolve from your point of view? My point of view is when you uh, represent people, right, not only in your marketing communications or your advertising communications, step beyond tokenism. If you are using, uh, if you are putting people with disabilities or people from the LGBT community in the advertisements, make sure your products are usable by them. Otherwise, it's not for them, right? It's just tokenism. So, all the right elements from your products to your branding to uh, having people with disabilities and people from the LGBTQ community and uh, people from the ageism community to have them in the representation of your companies so that, uh, you know, they know that the product is for them, the management stands by them, and uh, you have the, them representing in the advertisements as well. Because if you just have one element in place, it still has a missing piece of the puzzle, right? So. Amazing. On that note of tokenism, Ashish and Anjali, I would like to bring you in and ask you that what are some of the conversations that are happening in DNI? around the ecosystem, and I'm sure it goes beyond that ticking the box. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks for having me here, first of all, Prasad. And um, what I would like to say is that, you know, um, when you Can look at... Can we have the volume slightly higher? Okay. When you look at uh, diversity and inclusion, it's definitely a topic of consideration in advertising circles. I think what tends to happen is that a lot of brands intend to do something, but it translates into a very different thing when they bring that action into effect. And the reason why that happens is probably because there's either not enough authenticity or not enough genuine effort, or very often, you know, they don't know their consumer as well. So it ends up becoming tokenism while you know, the intent may be there, but the action doesn't kind of follow up with it. But I think that there is now a greater degree of awareness that is happening in, among, you know, advertisers. And uh, it is definitely a very pivotal agenda for a lot of organizations, uh, including for us, as I represent Mondelez. And I think that there are genuine efforts being made to kind of reach out to a larger, wider, more diverse community of people. And that effort is being backed with, you know, action and not just words or not just advertising content that you see one day and then it's gone tomorrow. So we're definitely hearing about that. And I think that diversity and inclusion is such a diverse topic. I mean, you can, the spectrum of it is very, very wide. What brands want to own has to be deeply rooted in their ethos. Thanks okay. for that. Ashish, uh, from the agency's point of view, do you hear the same things that the client is hearing? You know, uh, yes and no. The very fact that there's so many of us on a working day, post lunch, still awake, <laughs> listening to this, having this conversation is, I mean, it's, but it's a start, right? It's uh, like, I think the Kantar study told us that uh, in spite of some of the data that looks kind of, you know, not so hot, but we are still benched against the world, still progressing. Uh, I think Kenna's made a point about how 
uh, advertising has a long way to go versus movies. I come from the world of movies and I can tell you she's wrong. I'll give you just some crazy data points and since you're talking agency, I'm using the creative lens that, you know, we are the largest producers of movies in the world, right? We've been making movies since 1913 when Raja Harish Chandra, the first silent film came out. So 110 years odd. We make about 1,500 to 2,000 films every year across languages, Hindi, Punjabi, Telugu, Uriya, etc. So till date, we've made upwards of 50 to 60,000 films. Here's one data point. Out of those 50 to 60,000 films, you know, how many films had, and I'm just using one part of the spectrum because it's so wide, uh, how many films had disability representation? Take a wild guess. And I'm not even talking about films like a Tare Zabin Par, where the lead or the main protagonist, my name is Khan. I'm even talking about side character, like Farida Jalal in a wheelchair as Hero Ki Behen, Behan Amitabh, okay? Less than 250 films out of 60,000. That's 0.005%. That's like the number of giant pandas in the world, 1800, versus the total animals in the world, which is billions. You know, it's like the distance from this chair to the moon. <laughs> you know, if not taking into account the BKC traffic, right? So, now if I had to add one more data point in there, you know, how many of those portrayals were played by actually disabled characters? Less than 11. Less than 11. That's 0.00022%. That's like one can of Coca-Cola in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, right? So forget underrepresentation. It is not represented. But since you, Prasad, you brought up the, what are the kind of conversations happening? What's more dangerous than non-representation or underrepresentation is misrepresentation. Uh, I think Anjali used a lovely term as we were chatting about something called pity party. And it's so true. I mean, you look at reality shows, there's this, you know, the whole bechara narrative of Andhi Ma, Vidwa, Ben, <laughs> like violin bajrai, waves are lashing against the rocks, Piche Arijit Singh ka gana. You know, it's like, it's, it's shocking, right? So there's the whole pity party or it's the inspiration pawn. And like I think Anjali pointed out that at times it's about you know, the intent is positive, but that whole spotlight reeks of ableism. It is not normalized. That, alag hai, fir bhi ye kar diya. Pair nahi hai, fir bhi Everest chad gaya. Ye nahi hai, fir bhi race jeet gaya. I think normalizing this, this diversity is so important. So, inspiration pawn is the other dangerous narrative that we often see in terms of conversations. Yeah. And the third and the most dangerous, I think... Uh, you know, a few of the panelists, uh, you know, uh, Kanika and uh, Shigoriji kind of pointed it out that the most dangerous of the lot is the most insensitive one, where differences are played up for humor. Uh, I mean, no disrespect, Rohit is a friend, but you look at the whole Golmal franchise with Tushar Kapoor's character or playing up disability for comedy, I think those are the kind of narratives which are dangerous, which uh, fortunately is starting to change. But I mean, movies are way, way behind where advertising is. At least there is for all it's worth, even if the intentions are being woke today and the fact that you get called out on the internet if you're not sensitive. Uh, the fact that those conversations are happening and people are waking up to that is great, but hell, okay, long way to go. Okay, so we'll bring in the pity party uh, point again because that's been like a key term that even I picked up during lunch. Uh, how many of you hearing a bad echo? I think when Ashish was talking, it was like this political rallies and I'm the one dressed like a neta. So, <laughs> so if you can, please try and reduce the echo. Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, uh, uh, taking on from where Ashish left us, I want to move this conversation to Anirban and actually ask you that, you know, when an agency sits down with a brief, what are some of the fears that actually happen? Are you kind of afraid to push the envelope beyond a point saying the client is not going to buy this? What are some, you know, internal pressures that happen from the agency point of view? Um, I don't think there's anything really sensational there. I think most of the time, it's probably a sort of a default mode, right? Because most of the time, it is about the product. You're trying to demonstrate or dramatize a particular benefit. 
Having said that, I think there are two or three things um, that comes to mind. I think the first big issue, Prasad, is that um, somewhere in our head we have this uh, narrative of we want to build desire, right, for your product. And it seems like it would be better to, you know, just uh, do it in a manner which, you know, is largely mainstream, majoritarian, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I think the, the other part is, you know, when, I mean, of course, this is a long time back, but we are like the image makers, right? So you're trying to project. And now I think there is this huge proclivity towards creating this thing about positivity. Everything has to be about, you know, look very good and, you know, a, a perfect kind of a, kind of a thing. And I think these are some of the things that really, I think, inhibit us uh, or don't even, you know, let us start in the right way. We don't even start the conversation. But I think the one single thing I feel uh, we are missing out on is that we need to start on this early. You mentioned the brief. I don't think brief stage may we are discussing any form of inclusivity. I don't think it's on the agenda. And I think that is where it needs to happen. Even if sometimes it does happen, I think it, a lot of it comes from the creative team. But it's as a, as a strategy person, as a planning person, am I thinking of this as a powerful way? either to differentiate, uh, you know, my messaging, because I, I can tell you um, all my, I've spent a lot of time on the field, but that's really where it is. So, Raibareli, Sangli, Mumbai. Nowadays, people struggle to remember ads. It was not so, and I, I've been doing this for two decades plus. You go and people will tell you about ye tha, wo tha, wo dekha tha. Now, this is really, you know, kind of struggle. So I just think that from a pure recall perspective, we need to tell more authentic human stories. And I think once that sits in into our systems and our processes a lot more, I think we need to start from a DEI default rather than a desired default. And I think that's one thing. And the last sentence on that is, I think today we are seeing in our Meaningful Brand study also that people want collective benefits. We can work towards, desire is not only about my desire as an individual. I think we all desire a better reality and that's become very real for people. Okay, uh, if I can bring Sumit in, okay, uh, bringing, uh, you know, uh, a diverse set, you know, maybe people with disabilities, etc. into the picture. Uh, is that being used as an emotional hook and if that is indeed the case, is it fair? See, um, again, advertising has always been a numbers game, if I look at it that way, right? And um, if you look at the media industry in general, not just advertising, it has always been about hooks, right? Uh, if you don't get by hook the, or by crook. If you don't get the person to read the article, you won't get eyeballs, right? And Eyeballs uh, matter the most, so people resort to clickbait. So that is where they play the emotional angle to get emotions out of people. Now, I wouldn't say it's completely fair or unfair because it has both sides of the coin. One is it gets people to watch. Unless people watch it, you can't discuss whether it's good or bad because nobody has watched it, right? If nobody is watching it, you won't discuss about it, right? So, everything, every possibility about disability has two sides of the coin. If I might bring uh, up the conversation that uh, why are there not too many people with disabilities in advertisements, right? One of the answers to that might be there is no data, recent data, about the number of people with disabilities in India. The last census survey was done in 2011. And if I look at it, that time there were five disabilities, according to the People with Disabilities Act, Persons with Disabilities Act, 1995, right? Um, now, According to the Resale Act, there are 21 types of disabilities. If I might give you a conservative estimate, there are around 8 to 9 crore people with disabilities in India. If the companies realize this, they will be able to realize that they have a large number of audience or customers waiting for their products to acquire their products and be a part of their ecosystem. 
right? So unless there is data or there is numbers, even brands won't be interested because let's be real, at the end of the day, they are doing business, right? And they need to survive, to rack up profits, right? So at the end of the day, these data points are very important and that should be there because people say that they're if you look at India, 15% of uh, the population is LGBT. But if I say that many people with disabilities choose not to come out, many people from the LGBTQ community choose not to say that they are from the LGBTQ community, then where do you get the data from? The conversation lies there that whether we should be uh, looking at those numbers or not. Using emotions, is not fair. But then again, if nobody watches it, who have you made it for? Okay, but there are a lot of brands that have, um, you know, since he said that people do not come out of the closet, there are lots of brands that have actually helped in kind of bringing these people out of the closet or making them more comfortable to be in themselves. So, you know, one of the examples that I can think of immediately right now is Fast Track. Uh, so, you know, do these actually help in larger acceptance, not just in those communities, but also in the uh, kind of consumer at large? I, I think it totally does. I think because fundamentally advertising, I think like someone mentioned earlier, has the, has the power to not just shake perceptions. I think it can shape perceptions. I think and, uh, I'll give you echo happens only when you talk. Yeah. Maybe it's just my voice, man. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, you're able to hear me clearly enough, right? So, yeah, we're, we're can right. you all hear him clearly? I think Prasad, you're behind the speaker. No? That's why. So, I mean, I'll give you a very specific example since we've been talking about six pack band. So one of the music videos which was showcased over lunch, there was this lovely uh, transgender band member called Komal. So Komal was Kamlesh. Uh, at age 13 before she came out and uh, being from a conservative Gujarati family in Burivali, uh, she was kind of ostracized by the family and in disinherited and all of that and cut to almost a decade later when this first music video dropped and I remember when the first music video came out, this is 2016 when, I mean forget Netflix, Amazon, uh, Geo, you know, since we're treating the Geo Center, was Seva Ki Ma, Geo Telecom had not happened yet, right? So if you hit a million organically, that number is massive. And that first video dropped uh, and it exploded. It clocked a million views and I remember I got a call from, I mean the likes of Rithik, that's why he's done a music video with them. Because that's the kind of stuff that happened on a Salman Khan film trailer. So it just exploded. And uh, forget the Khan's Grand Prix Glass Lion win and you know, uh, the fact that it impacted business for a very conservative Chayka brand like Brookborn Red Label, about it outsold the package D category 30%. I think the most powerful impact in terms of acceptance was that Komal, and this happened in front of my eyes, received a phone call from someone after 10 years, that and that was a father. I think that's the kind of, I mean, I still get goosebumps when I talk about it. I think, so truly, I believe it can materially impact shake, shape perception. So that's just one great example of that. Okay, and uh, uh, to, you know, ask Anjali about the pity party, uh, companies either do DNI or they don't do it at all. Uh, so more often than not, this becomes such an in-your-face representation, something that we touched upon. Is there a middle path to actually having DNI in communication? So I would say most of the advertising that you see today borders on the pity party space and that's because what they try to do is to highlight the issue and then kind of bring it to the forefront and make you realize that you need to be inclusive. I think inclusivity comes more from it being authentically woven into the tapestry of your communication. It should not be something that's forced. So if there, is there a middle path? I don't think there is literally a need for a middle path. I don't think you need to highlight the fact that you are trying to be diverse and inclusive. I think if you just normalize it, then you've kind of won the battle. You don't need to really bring it up front and in focus and then kind of, you know, say, oh, by the way, I did something different or I'm trying to make a difference to society. Normalize it. It's just like anybody else, any other character you would have in your advertising, 
just let it be part of the regular advertising storytelling because that's what advertising does it does storytelling bring it as part of the storyline okay but uh, from a kind of you know if i can ask anirban about this if you normalize it will you then get the eyeballs that sumit was talking i think uh, it's it's all depends finally on intent no prasad see if your whole intention is is not sincere see the other thing i must tell you is that today we are in an exposed world in a broadcast era brands used to be owned by brand owners abhi everybody is a brand owner your in fact uh, you know consumers say that they expect brands to be a platform where they can express themselves so if you go out there with uh, what you are calling tokenism or you know just doing some little oh we support so and so on social media i'm not naming but there has been cases like that people will hold you down they'll say hey don't do this i mean you it's not shown in your actions it's not doesn't bear out i mean or it's not even probably relevant to what you do right i don't think that um, the idea is either to normalize it or not i think it's all about whether it's really really relevant right and are we able to drive a certain degree of change and sensitivity above all i think understanding really some of the issues right i think today if you look at it i think we would be sitting and discussing this about 5 or 7 years back i mean i was doing some work with oxfam on discrimination and we've seen that gender stereotypes were a huge issue have has it become a much better place over a period of time in fact i'm i'm reminded by a very powerful line we had seen on the un report which said if she sees it she can be it right and that sort of we're seeing a trajectory and i think i think that's really where the collective impact of all of this is because you know i'm i'm sorry i'm a little theoretical but there is an impact of communication which is not immediate it is what we call cultivation which is fundamentally how you start viewing the world because of a sum total of sigma of everything that you see and i think as long as that is is moving i think it can it really makes a lot of a difference okay can, this sorry prashant i can just yeah. add a great example of representation of the, i mean diversity having business i mean being accepted by audiences one of the most successful recent films if you guys have seen the new spider man franchise with tom holland you know so if you remember the first one when it came out if you look at the casting genius casting right so there's tom holland a spider man his girlfriend's like a you know mexican uh his best friend's a chinese guy and flash is an indian and the producer i remember was asked at marvel that why so much diversity was this planned what was the inspiration and her answer to the press junket was as simple as have you guys been to college recently look around it was inspired by reality and it was normalized that's i think what was powerful in the films gone on to do like a billion dollars so yeah. absolutely i think normalize it i mean if you walk i mean it's just and i think sumit uh, like he rightly pointed out right the numbers are so under indexed i mean because we're only still talking visible disabilities right uh, stuff that you can see and that number itself is like a it's 20% of the world that's a fifth of the world's population minute you put in invisible disabilities autism dyslexia uh, neurodivergence that number not estimated accurately is 37 and a half percent that's more than every third person and if you're not talking to these guys in your advertising man it's like making a phone and saying it's only for men i <laughs> mean you're missing a trick right so absolutely it just makes business sense to do that and it absolutely works when they feel seen they can be it okay it might be making business sense but all of us are trained to be safe rather than risky right or be on the edge or be edgy uh how do you then fight this problem both as agencies and clients in trying to convince internally that this is really worth the cost go first yeah you can go first no i i really think uh, the lady just the, smiled saying yeah let him go no, first i think the the risk part really sang, uh, i mean uh, prasad is a little overrated i don't think controversy is a strategy and i don't think any of us go into uh, all of these things with a certain sense of uh, this thing but yeah i mean there is a possibility as i said today you get exposed and i think um, we need to have probably some kind of uh, expected plan right and in on social media i call it you know address redress condone or ignore right and you need to have some kind of a thought process on all, all all of this but i think as i keep on saying this that if it is relevant to product and the benefit and what the brand wants to stand for okay and again i'm uh, i'm coming from data which is that this year what we, whatever we've done in our our study 
It's a very robust number, 8,000 people surveyed. I think youngsters today want brands to come out and say that they are diverse, diversity, uh, in, equity, and inclusion friendly. It's something that they want because brand gives you that badge today. Earlier it was about conspicuous consumption, today it's about conscious consumption. People want to wear brands that stand for something, right? So you can't really be safe. What I think happens is that one or two cases, it goes really off bad. Certain people, you know, take umbrage, but I don't think there's any way to budget for it, really. You can, you can probably just, you know, because you have to go finally with what I call conviction. If you're not convinced about what you're doing, if you're like, Ki, achha, ye karke dekh lete hai, you are going to retract, right? But if you have a strength of conviction that comes from, and I, I always say this, that I think a lot of what is happening, at least from my immediate reality, is that there are people inside our company who are leading this thought process. So we did an exceptional piece of work on Vanish uh, you know, um, in, in the UK, and it is about how autistic people have a genuine need for continuity on clothes. It came from somebody who's seen it at close quarters and works in the agency, right? So I just think that, I mean, what, I mean, when you come from something so authentic, what I call an insider understanding of it, rather than, you know, a very external view, I think you are going to be able to do a lot of these things. But right? nine out of ten times, now this is a brilliant example of a need-based solution. But nine out of ten times, it's about, hey, that's a great emotional pitch. Let me, let me try and fit uh, it to the brand that can closely match that attribute, assuming that you have a bouquet of brands. I think that's, that's what we see. I personally, I mean, my experience with all the clients we're working is, I think today there is a real recognition of diversity, exclusion. It may, might have been, as with anything in the world, People start off, there is a crest of over-expectation, there is a trough, and then, you know, you normalize. I think today we all look for high level of synergy. I definitely think that it is far more well thought through, far more sensitive and empathetic, even when we start. I don't think it is expedient anymore at all. Okay, but, you know, since he spoke about, you know, one of the inherent fears is about trolling. If I can ask Sumit, you know, given your interactions with a lot of companies, does this come across that, you know, the fear of being trolled if I put out a message that's slightly going to be... See, um, that was there before. Now, if after independence, after so many years, I could have the first diversity, equity and inclusion conference in Calcutta and major Fortune 500 companies supporting it, it puts out a statement that we are there to make a statement that we stand behind diversity, equity, and inclusion because people have realized that generations that are more serious about the issues, if you do not put out advertisements that are socially responsible and representative of all people, they will not stand behind you because all lives matter. Everybody has a place to belong on this beautiful planet and the planet belongs to us all. Okay, you know, that's a very nice point and I think that deserves a round of applause because today in some ways is the D-Day because when ASCII is backing something like this, it's going to get a lot more traction. Uh, however, if I can ask Ashish, you know, you were among the early guys to push this inclusion agenda with the six-pack band. Uh, I would have, and since this was about seven years back, I could have easily kind of, maybe I can guess that it took a real kind of scaling the summit kind of effort on your part. How difficult was it? Oh, it wasn't easy. You know, so you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, think about it. We were, uh, this was sponsored by a 102-year-old legacy brand, you know, Chai Ki Patti, Paitis Rupay Mein Bikti Hai, Small Town, and that classic advertising cliche of, will Minakshi from Madurai get it? you know, which kills a lot of advertising ideas. But I think people don't credit Minakshi from Madurai. She's way smarter than you think. You know, our consumer is really smart. So I think uh, it just, uh, I think Ruchira made a lovely point earlier about, I think we also need to, you know, uh, present the data accurately. And like they say, you know, if content is king, context is King Kong. And I mean, if you look at the stuff at, in 2016, the timing was just absolutely right. So. Obama had just gone onto the cover of an LGBT magazine called Open. 
transparent, if you guys have seen that show at, uh, on, on Prime, had picked up all these Golden Globes and Emmys. Lavenne Cox, Orange is the New Black, uh, was on uh, Time Magazine's cover as among the top 100 influential people of all time. Uh, 377 had just been abolished, gay marriages were legalized. So that piece was just bubbling under and the timing was just right and it exploded. But it took a lot of doing with Unilever, of course, and with Group M, but I mean, they were with us but it required a lot of this packaging data presenting that it makes business sense. And you mentioned risk. Bahut logo ki fatti hai, Prasad. Ke yaar, you know, the classic danger of a brand manager, ke yaar, ye kar diya, what if it backfires? What if you get trolled? And that's happened to a few people like Titan, even if the intentions are positive, that yaar, ye galat kya. And it, some of these communities, for lack of phrase, uh, uh, phrases, can be jihadi. Ke bhai, any way no. we misunderstood. And, so for, and for, so for every brand that scared, gets trolled, yeah. there so are 20 other companies saying, that are going to... Yaar, nahi karte, let's play safe. But, the truth is, the riskiest thing you can do today is to play safe. Yes, sir. It's, I mean, it's nothing short of dangerous, right? And this data, like, like Anirban always uses data to kind of make his point, and it's true. If you look at the most recent Wonderman Thompson study, 71% of Gen Z talks about how if you don't have progressive portrayals in your advertising and your content, your brand is going to be irrelevant. Now, there's no bigger risk than that. If you also have a blind spot for more than one third of your demographic or your potential audience, man, the risk can't be higher than that. So I think that's the packaging, the data point that you need to go with. Uh, and I think what helped me sell the six pack band, and I remember doing this at one of their content days, and I remember <laughs> Anjali was there, is that I could go up and say that, Yar, ye main kar I'm doing this irrespective of whether you're in or not. I think at times, Brands, etc., also need to see creators' conviction and say, Yar, yeah. I'll miss the bus on this. I need to jump in. Even if your initial intent is clickbaity, it's a potential award pandering. I think there's a lovely phrase that the other Anirban Ban used earlier. But, shuru to karo, yar. Get started and stuff will fall into place. It's, it is a journey. It is a long, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So, you have to be up for that. I just lovely. want to add one thing yeah. that, you know, uh, Ashish talked about. See, I think as, uh, and speaking of the advertising community as such, we generally tend to uh, look at a demographic and generalize them or stereotype them, you know, amazing, like the Menakshi of Madurai. Actually, the consumer has moved beyond that, right? And we don't really realize it because we don't spend enough time with that consumer understanding what has changed in their life. So, yeah, we're all victims of that generalization. Okay. So one final question. Yeah. I just wanted to add, uh, bring the thought back which we started with. I think there is, we are discussing advertising and I understand there is a huge part of the reality which is depictive, right? But I also think we need to start thinking about demonstrative, which is are you actually creating acts, right? Whether it's a change in uh, packaging or So you some stole form. the thunder from my final question. It was ah. going to be perfect. Oh, okay. Okay. Anyway, okay. you can okay. go okay. ahead. No, I, I genuinely think that because, you know, some of the most uh, beautiful things that I have seen in my, especially the advisory phase of my career when I was doing uh, Great Place to Work and all, is that there is so much power actually in when you do something, when you really make a difference, right? Right, you create like, a, a, we created a returnship program which is allowing women to actually bounce back. And imagine why it's strategic is because we are all crying, saying there is no talent, there's no talent. Here is talent leaking out, going away. Right? When we uh, do access and, and disabled friendly in your own premises to begin with, it makes a statement. Right? And I think there is a lot more that in this demonstrative space that we can, because the idea, it, just communicating that we did that, it becomes strong enough, pardon my using advertising, if, if that's what you want to call it. Brilliant. You know, Bob, and uh, before we open it up to the audience for questions, just to check that all of you have not uh, being kind of asleep or looking for black coffee. So, before we open it up to you, I'll just ask this panel for their final comments on how can you be move beyond depictive to being demonstrative? How are you doing it in your respective organizations? Um, so, I'll start. Yeah, please. I think it's important for brands to find internal champions within their organizations so that they understand why should they do it at the first place, right? It took me 
a lot of convincing to the chairman of the society to organize this conference in Calcutta, which I did right. None of them were willing to do it. None of other organizations were willing to do it, but somebody took it up, right? And that organization did a great job at organizing the conference, right? And they were running the risk of being uh, called out. That why a DEI conference in a city like Calcutta, which never had uh, anything uh, previously about DEI, talking about DEI, right? And they took the risk. Uh, so one of the reasons was because the chairman was known to me. He saw me for years, right? And uh, so put your faith on the internal champions of the company. Not only, you know, put um, faith on the advertising, but also make ERGs, involve the ERGs of the company into the advertising team. All of the brands have ERGs these days. Involve people from the ERGs that this is what we are discussing in the advertising team. Would you like to be a part of it? This is something we don't do. Right. Any other thoughts? I just want to talk about what we do in Mondelez. So while a lot of organizations do have a DEI, uh, you know, agenda, I think we basically walk the talk. So even our company policy mirrors that a lot. The other thing is in all our advertising, we're making sure that, you know, it is well represented. And also the people that we take in our advertising, and they're usually known faces, are also people who kind of lend themselves well to diversity. The other bit is that uh, most of what we do under diversity is walking the talk, so we don't kind of just put out an advertisement over there. We follow it up with an action that is genuine and, you know, there is a concerted effort to do something different or to make a change. So that's really on the front for Mondelez. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think three thoughts, essentially. There's a great saying in the community, uh, especially in the disability community, that nothing about us without us. And I think no matter what a guy does, it's, it's, you know, it's like having a panel discussion about gender equality with five men. It just sounds stupid, right? So I think it's really important to have that casting recruitment to begin from there. Like I think Kenna spoke about that unless there's a working mom on your team, uh, you know, how are you going to really understand how, how she functions, how she thinks? So I think all of these different cohorts need to be represented, so represented at the origin stage, uh, at client ends and the marketing divisions in the advertising side. Uh, so representation both on screen and off screen. I think just one of the pieces in the framework that Diageo spoke about, representation and perspective. Also of the people who are telling those stories. You know, like, so everything that we do at a special, there is a tie-in at the back end with neurodivergence. It could be as simple as catering being from a cloud kitchen run by neurodivergent folks, or it could be an AD on set. And you know, and it fundamentally changes everyone. Like I had this Parsi, you know, 19-year-old, very talented autistic boy doing a Bhojpuri music video for Ching's Desi Chinese. <laughs> really fun. And uh, as is often the case, people don't talk to uh, people with differences at times to talk through them. So I had this super talented Bollywood choreographer directing this video and he's like, sir, ye, uh, behind the scenes video, ye shoot kar lega kya? and Farhan, a lovely boy, he looks at me and says, hey sir, tell him no, I'm autistic, not stupid. Huh? So <laughs> beautiful. So I think that's really that representation because it fundamentally changed the crew. It changed us as people of how to, like when we did Six Pack Band 2, which was neurodivergent kids, I think just the things of, you know, make the place sensory sensitive of uh, coming down to the kid's eye level while talking. And in Bollywood, there is dance choreography, so the speaker is on Ganpati level. Pe bachta hai. So keeping it a few decibels softer, you know, just simple things like that, it just changed each one in the crew. So representation on and off screen, first and foremost. Two, accessibility. And that's not on anyone's radar. Now, if you look at accessibility, accessibility is not just a ramp. It's not just subtitles. But I think the streaming business has also already jumped forward in just the fundamental way of bringing in all text and all of that. I think, I don't think there's a standardized mandate of bringing that in. You know, so I think advertising needs to kind of catch up on that. There's this lovely learning which we can take from Hollywood. They have something, they introduced this about four years back. It's called the inclusion rider. So all the big stars can ask, leverage the inclusion rider, which mandates 50% of representation of diversity 
not just in cast, in the crew. It could be a person in the background. Five people walking at the back. Represent. Yeah, sorry, I'll wrap up. And, and so I think that accessibility as a filter. And the third and last thing, I think purpose. I think while I was in Lintas, this is many years back. God, I feel old. But uh, this lovely Alec Padamsi and Gulan Kripalani used to run this division called SOMAC. Social Advertising Marketing Communication. So a percentage of the agency's resources of creative folks, etc., got to do advertising campaigns which were put up on the billboard at Babul Nath. And not just because it won awards, but they put their money where their mouth was, you know, and I think that not just as a percentage of CSR funds, but doing that will fundamentally positively impact. So RAP, rap is what I'd leave you with. Brilliant. Uh, do we have time for questions? If yes, then no, we're running out of time. So what a lovely discussion this has been just so that I can wrap it up. I think uh, like a lot of this panel largely agreed, this is going to be driven more and more by the requirements of the business. There was, you know, to take an example beyond DNI, there was a time when a very famous toothpaste brand used to mock saying, Badan ke liye dood badam or dato ke liye koila. Then, you know, because of the pressures of economics, okay, that they realized that the pressure can actually turn that charcoal into diamonds and soon they launched a charcoal-based toothbrush, a charcoal-based toothpaste on their own. I guess such a huge kind of build-up from an economic point of view where the consumer will drive change, will make us all effective in our DEI space. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being such a lovely audience. And panelists, thank you for being so engaging. And I learned a lot from you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.